Hello, everybody. I am joined uh, here today with Matthew Pottinger, who is the former Deputy National Security Advisor of the United States and is now a distinguished visiting fellow at the Hoover Institution. Matt, I, I've talked with you before, and um, you were in the Trump administration up until the almost the very end. The day you resigned was January 6th, and you packed up your office and walked out into an America that is quite a bit different. Would you give me some of your thoughts about how the country looked to you at that very moment? Sure. <clears throat> yeah. Well, yeah, it's, you know, it, it's funny when you work in government, particularly at really high level jobs, working in the White House, um, uh, you, you, you think, you would you would think that you have this enormous panopticon on everything that's happening in the world, and in a way you do. You have it. You have incredible um, uh, an incredible vantage point onto what's going on in terms of national security around the world. Uh, but in, in another respect, it's almost like you're in a submarine. <laughs> you're you know yeah. you're you're cut off from uh, the rest of society. You're working seven days a week, frequently uh, very very long hours, and so um, uh, you know as as I left. And uh, uh, in fact, I, you know, the, the day after I had uh, uh, resigned, I, I left Washington DC and uh, moved out uh, to the Rockies <laughs> where my wife and I have now settled. And, uh, and yeah, you know, it, in, in a very different um, world in many respects, one where the divisions uh, politically uh, in our country are unlike anything uh, that I've seen in my lifetime. My father worked in government uh, back in the 70s, so I often would ask him, you know, re reassure me that it's not as bad as it was then. And he says, <laughs> no, it's worse. <laughs> it's actually worse. Um, so it, 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 just historically, we are uh, more polarized than we've ever been. Uh, and, uh, and of course, uh, COVID is part of the reason for that. It was one of those things, as you've written, that that laid bare all of the cracks in our society and and tapped wedges into them. Um, and, and another factor, I think, is just modern media in in the broadest sense of the term media. The fact that so many people get their information now from social media, which increasingly um, isn't edited by human beings. It's it's algorithms that are driven by commercial interest. To um, uh, that that submerge each and every one of us into our own private echo chambers in ways that exacerbate and amplify um, uh, problems or or that amplify our biases. Uh, I I'm still one of those. I'm an optimist in the sense that I don't actually think our our country is worse off um, empirically uh, than than it was. In fact, I think we've made enormous progress in many respects. In terms of uh, you know social progress, in terms of social justice, uh, in, in terms of um, uh, uh, you know the historical uh, wrongs and and it, and legacies that we've had to deal with as a as a major part of our history, I actually think we've made progress on a lot of those things. But uh, but people are more angry about those things than ever, and I I think that we uh, underestimate the role that um, uh, that social media in particular plays in all of that. This disunity that we're talking about, so evident on January 6th, but evident really all the time, uh, driven much by the social media that you're talking about, it poses a national security problem, doesn't it? It does. Well, it, look, <clears throat> it poses the most fundamental problem, which is deeper than just a national security problem. It erodes uh, people's trust and faith in our system. And, um, you know, I think I have enough historical perspective just from having lived in a lot of countries around the world. I, I've been a reporter uh, in Asia. I, I fought in a couple of wars as a U.S. Marine. I, I, I have a pretty intimate sense of what other parts of the world are like. I still think that that representative liberal democracy is the greatest political invention and the greatest system that we've ever devised, even with all of its faults, even with all of the significant um, uh, frustrations and disappointments, um, it, it still does better, uh, and it has withstood the test of time. We're 240 years into this thing. Uh, we're the longest standing republic. We're the, we're the oldest uh, democracy. Uh, and, um, you know, I've lived in countries that have undergone horrendous 
uh, political uh, dislocation and, and wrenching changes in, in part because of the, the systems of government. I mean, China, I mean, w w when I was uh, uh, a kid uh, in the 70s, <clears throat> China was still emerging from uh, the Cultural Revolution, uh, the, a 10 year period of, um, uh, you know, anarchy. Uh, that was driven by, you know, the selfish interests of, of a dictator, Mao Zedong. Um, and, and 10 years before that, uh, you, you had seen mass starvation uh, in, yeah. a, in a, uh, a government driven campaign that led to people estimate between 40 and 50 million people died. That's like one in 15 people at the time living in China died of yeah. starvation or, or political purges. So, uh, so you know, as you, as you zoom out on the telescope of time, and, and look at how we fared as a society, as a republic, as a liberal democracy, um, no one else comes close, uh, e even though we need to do a lot better. And so I think, I think that those, the, thing, the national security risk is that people lose faith in this system of government and inadvertently put ourselves into the position of not being citizens anymore, but being future subjects of some dictator or some uh, autocrat. Yeah, when you look at which countries did well, you mentioned the pandemic, those countries that did well are the countries that had a high level of trust in their government. And it's been such a dismaying correlation because we were supposed to be the best prepared country in the world, and we were one of the worst. And you know, the, I think the, the lessons that we have to draw from this are really apparent, but whether we can do it, uh, I'm not sure. You mentioned China. And um, you speak Mandarin, uh, you, you spent time in China. Uh, right now, there's, China is under scrutiny because of the origin of this pandemic. And I, I'd like to get your thoughts about uh, the likelihood that this was, I mean, it could have been, it could have derived from nature. It might have come from a bat as SARS-1 did. You were in China when SARS-1 came out in 2002 and three. And it might have passed through an intermediate animal, or it might have come from a lab leak, uh, which is more common than many people realize. I mean, SARS-1 leaked out of labs in China four times, but smallpox leaked out of labs in the UK three times, killing nearly 100 people. So CDC and Fort Detrick have had their leaks. So these things happen. And if it happened in China, it was a terrible mistake. But if the Chinese knew about it, and covered it up. It's one of the great crimes of history. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I mean, you lay out very, uh, very accurately. I think the, the you know, the, the two leading hypotheses, right? Uh, the, the, the only two hypotheses that anyone's really discussing, which is a natural origin uh, or an accidental uh, leak. Um, I, I think both are possible. Uh, I'm open-minded to both. I've, I've looked at the, uh, the ledger of um, circumstantial evidence on both sides. I would say that the list of evidence uh, accumulating on the side that this was an accidental leak, leak uh, far outweighs the circumstantial evidence on the side that this time it was another natural origin um, but, but we don't know for sure. And China doesn't want us to know. <laughs> I don't think the Chinese government itself uh, wants to, to delve any deeper, even internally in its own system, because when, when you have a, a neo-totalitarian dictatorship, really any authoritarian system uh, doesn't prioritize the pursuit of truth as a high priority. It prioritizes always the preservation of, of a dictator's or a party's monopoly on power. And truth is often very dangerous stuff <laughs> to, uh, you know, to, to a uh, party's monopoly on power. And so, um, you know, I was struck, one of, one of the interesting things was even several months into this outbreak, when the WHO began to um, uh, make its tentative steps towards trying to have, open a discussion with China, about where this thing may have emerged, uh, the WHO officials were stunned last summer, summer of 2020, to discover that Beijing hadn't even begun uh, doing any serious uh, research into the natural origin uh, hypothesis, much less into the lab leak hypothesis. So um, Beijing, there, there's, there's nothing in it for Beijing uh, as a single party dictatorship uh, to, you know, there's nothing in it for, for them 
to, to get to the bottom of uh, how this thing uh, actually emerged, even though the future of, of you know, public health in their country and in ours and, right. and every country in between uh, depends on, on uh, discovering the origin of this thing. Uh, we're not that much closer uh, because Beijing has has withheld any cooperation or or the sharing of any data. But the things that are emerging from the public space, from enterprising scientists and others uh, who are digging into this, just as really as private detectives, you know, people on their own, mm-hmm. on the, of their own volition, wanting to to find out the the circumstantial evidence is certainly accumulating pretty rapidly on the side of this having been a, a, an accidental leak. Yeah, it's, it's a very damning thing that uh, the WHO is now gearing up for a third trip to China, but still haven't gotten invited to try to determine the origin of this. And I was reflecting on the SARS-1 outbreak when you were there. And at that time, you know, the, the Chinese uh, reportedly hid patients from world health authorities, putting them in ambulances and taxis until the authorities were out of town. And the international health regulations were rewritten to take into account the Chinese obfuscation. And this is the first big test of of their reliability and uh, it's failing by every single measure. And I don't know what else can be done. Uh, it's, It's really shocking to see the the obfuscation and the resistance on the part of that regime, which has got to be damaging its reputation uh, all over the world. Yeah, yeah. So uh, one of the things that we have to be honest with ourselves about is that you know, global institutions, uh, UN agencies, and including the WHO, play an important role. But but we we often uh, um, imbue them with responsibilities and and authority that um, that they don't have and that they can, never really can have because they're not they're not sovereign governments right they are uh, they they are institutions that every country in the world including China uh, have uh, have some stake in varying stakes the United States is by far the largest contributor to the WHO. Uh, but it, it's all well and good to have rules, but you can't, the WHO is not going to be able to enforce those kinds of rules, the international health regulations you mentioned. Only sovereign governments can do that. And when, when a country is irresponsible, as Beijing has been so irresponsible uh, from the beginning uh, with this pandemic, uh, you really have to turn to coalitions of sovereign governments uh, to band together in a multilateral way, uh, but not always. Uh, but not always through uh, a UN mechanism uh, to find ways of imposing costs on countries that do not play by those rules. And that's something that we were that we were moving toward uh, over the course of 2020. We were looking at uh, formulating a uh, sort of a uh, coalition of nations that could respond to pandemics in part by sharing information with one another very rapidly, but also by imposing uh, uh, costs on those co- countries that are not playing along. So we looked at the G7 as sort of the core of that, uh, of that group, but we wanted to add countries like Australia and India, uh, South Korea and Brazil, uh, so to expand it beyond that core uh, G7. But all of these are, are democracies. They're countries that enjoy the rule of law. And that's usually a good place to start. Countries that actually have, that have the rule of law are, are, are going to do a better job uh, and be more responsive to one another and, and to the globe uh, than, than a country that, that doesn't even have an independent judiciary, uh, as is the case under the Chinese Communist Party. So I, I hope that the Biden administration revisit some of those ideas and looks for a way to build a coalition of the willing. The Biden administration has not been unwilling to take that approach in other areas uh, related to our national security. You saw this uh, announcement, which I think was a very good announcement by the Biden administration just the other day about the AUKUS, the the Australia, uh, UK, US um, uh, grouping uh, to to work together on uh, uh, national defense and and to help you know, in essence, it wasn't explicitly stated, but clearly it's about trying to deter China from uh, becoming adventuristic with its military in the Western Pacific. So uh, let's talk about national security in the broad sense. Uh, It seems like we're always missing the next thing. 
and the pandemic is a good example. I mean, your experience in the White House was that they had very little understanding of what was emerging out of China. And as a reporter, you began uh, making calls and you know uh, digging up you know, sources that you revisited. Uh, it's often occurred to me that reporters can get more information than you know uh, NSA just trying to listen to things, calling people and asking. It seems like the the initiative of the intelligence community just isn't in that direction. But the pandemic, climate change, you know, these are these are real threats to our society that we don't seem to be prepared to examine. How would you? Uh, look at it and what changes would you suggest? Well, you know, it's like we're talking about how we we uh, project authorities onto the WHO that that it that it doesn't have, probably shouldn't even have. We do the same thing in the United States in projecting uh, capabilities and authorities onto um, our intelligence community, which is, you know, this collection of more than a dozen uh, agencies and departments that, that gather intelligence around the world. You know, intelligence agencies actually have a fairly narrow set of capabilities and, and they're, they're good at, at some of those narrow things. It's really, in, you know, it, it's, it's gathering secrets. You know, it's not about um, uh, gathering a broad uh, scope of, of information and, uh, and uh, coming up with a, a deeply researched uh, set of possibilities. That, that's not what the IC has ever been good at. Uh, you, may, you know, the list of, of strategic analytic failures of the IC is legendary, right? It far outweighs the things that they've gotten right uh, in terms of strategic analysis. Uh, uh, you know, we, we thought that the Soviet Union was going to surpass us economically and in terms of its military and nuclear capability, you know, um, decades and decades ago. Uh, and, and then when in fact we, we, we were on the eve of the collapse of the Soviet Union, um, uh, the, the IC thought that, that the Soviets had another 30 or 40 years, uh, uh, no sweat, you know, that, you know, there's, a, there's always a status quo bias built in. Right. They, they, they missed, uh, uh, the, the Arab Spring, right? Um, they missed the rise of China, uh, or, or to the extent that they watched the rise of China, they thought that it would be wholly benign to liberal democracies around the world when it was anything but. They were still peddling that crap in 2017 when I came into office. I mean, I was just blown away by how out of touch um, the, the analysis was. But you've got, a, you've got brilliant people in the intelligence community. You've got a great collection of information. You've got people out in the field doing brave, difficult work. Uh, but, but the system of the IC, I mean, you're a journalist. You've spent your, your career as a writer and a journalist. And if you look at almost any industry that's in the business of trying to gather and analyze information quickly and then to disseminate that information, no other organization or institution uh, is, is designed the way that the IC is. It, it, the design of the IC is almost antithetical to the, to, um, the way that a, a good investigative you know, newsroom uh, yeah. is designed. Those are very flat organizations. They're fairly small, uh, you, decently resourced, we hope. But, yeah. but we're, you've only got, I mean, when I was a Wall Street Journal reporter doing investigative reports on the first SARS epidemic, I, I basically had only two uh, layers that I had to report to before that stuff would hit the front page of the Wall Street Journal. I had my bureau chief, uh, and then you had, um, you know, the editor, uh, you know, the managing editor, and then some copy editors on the side. No one was trying to pressure me into uh, some kind of weird consensus view of what was going on, where we would have to create a huge committee, and then we would have to report up through, you know, 15 or 20 layers before that, that news article, if you will, you know, an a, a analytic report would, would reach the desk of the president of the United States or some other policymaker. So we can't expect the IC to ever really grapple with these hard strategic questions. They're never going to get it right because of the way that the hierarchical way that it's built. So what do you do about that? I mean, there's some interesting ideas floating around. One, one that I've been discussing with a a couple friends of mine who used to be in the intelligence community is the idea of just having a, a, a small, well-resourced, federally funded research and development uh, uh, um, corporation 
In other words, it'd be federally funded, but it would be private in the sense that you can hire and fire people at will. You, you don't have a, a big you know, career bureaucracy. And what I would do is hire retired investigative reporters and put them in this shop and make it a research shop uh, to the executive branch of, of the US government to, to research things related to national security, but, but not, not to always come up with one uh, consensus answer, but to give us possibilities. You know, one of the things the IC could do, uh, it, it do itself a favor in our country favor uh, by doing more of this, what's called red teaming, where you have mm. several possibilities presented to decision makers to say, we don't know which one's gonna be, is true. Here are the possibilities, here are the pros and cons. Here, here, here's the evidence that you can weigh in favor or against each of these possibilities. Then what you do is you give you, you empower those policymakers to start planning for different possibilities and to make determinations for themselves uh, about what's, what's really going on. So I would look at, at stacking a small uh, federally funded shop with uh, retired um, excellent uh, investigative news reporters and having them answering questions asked by uh, the departments and agencies, national security. Right. That plays into an idea that I've had, but it's a, it's a little different. I don't, I would like BBC and Agents France Press, you know, the government subsidizes those organizations. Uh, you, it, when I was a young reporter, there were news bureaus, American news bureaus all over the world. People lived in those countries, they learned their languages, you know, they made friends and they were there for sometimes decades. And they really knew the country. Then it became people like me who parachute in and, you know, try to hire some people to help translate and get a sense of the place and you go back and make an authoritative report. I don't see why uh, we can't arrange something where we would set up bureaus that where the rent is paid and, you know, the reporters are free, but, you know, they may be reporting for NPR or PBS or something like that there, but they're, they are not bound. But the other thing that I think is the intelligence community and the re reporting world have a Chinese wall, so to speak, between them. They're not supposed to talk to each other. And I think that's a huge mistake. I think that there should be a much freer exchange of information because you know, the intelligence community so often just listens, whereas the reporters talk. And I, I was in Afghanistan in 2003 when I was briefed at the, the embassy and I, I, I'm pretty sure it was a, a CIA officer who was talking to me. He said, I'd like to do what you do. And he said, what do you mean? Talk to people. I said, well, why, why don't you open the door and go talk to them? It just wasn't thought of. And, you know, I think that going back to your paper about the failure of military intelligence, I think we have, a, have to get a new paradigm. No, this is, it, uh, these are all good ideas. And I, uh, you know, I, I fret at the shrinking of our overseas bureaus of private uh, news gathering organizations um, it, it, that's largely been driven by the, the new economics, you know, in the age of the internet, it's become a lot more expensive as ad, uh, ad spends have dropped precipitously for our, our newspapers in, in the United States. Um, you know, there, there aren't even that many newspapers left, frankly, yeah. right? You used to have multiple newspapers in every city. Um, one thing that we could look at, you know, related to what you're talking about is, is, you know, creating incentives for private news gathering organizations. It could be in the form of tax breaks, for, for those that open overseas news bureaus, uh, mm -hmm. that their, their tax breaks or other incentives that, that would go along with that. Um, look, I mean, Washington, D.C. has become a, a, a tragic comedy. It, just the number of reporters who are gathered in, in the Capitol. I mm -hmm. mean, if you could get every news bureau to agree to, to reduce by half the number of correspondents that they have in Washington, D.C., and, and send half half of the half that you <laughs> preserve, I'd send half of the half into the hinterland of the United States so that they're covering yeah. state capitals again, local news, so, you know, which is so critical to preventing corruption and, and keeping you know, people informed. And the other half, send them overseas. Um, and um, I, I, think, I think that there's a very good case to be made and we could come up creatively with ways of incentivizing that. But I think we, it starts with pulling in all of the owners of, of of yeah. all of our, you know, our major news uh, organizations and saying, guys, 
um, if we want to have a republic, you know, we have to have a government and and an electorate, you know, a citizenry that's informed. Right now, we're, we're not, you know, the, the days of, you know, Henry Luce, who was all about, you know, through Time Magazine, uh, trying to inform the American public about the world. We need to have that kind of a spirit again. And, and, and of course, you want to find ways to economically incentivize it as well. I think we could yeah. do it if we, if we were creative. Uh, you know, when we invaded Iraq, 75% of Americans thought that Saddam Hussein was responsible for Al Qaeda and 9-11. And, and, and it's educating the populace is not just for our sake. The whole world needs for America to be educated so it doesn't make those kinds of mistakes again. Yeah, no, a absolutely. And, and look, and th that that's one of the beauties of our system is that we've got a, a private we've got free speech, you know, we're able to reward and, uh, you know, people who are like yourself who go out and gather information and write it up about the world. We shouldn't be looking to the IC to answer these questions. Yeah. I mean, the, the fact, I, I was glad that President Biden renewed, you know, at the beginning of the summer, um, uh, sort of a government query, inquiry into where this, uh, this uh, pandemic that's killed millions of our fellow citizens actually originated. The mistake was that he assigned, he assigned that task to the, to the, again, the Intel community. The Intel well, community, huge mistake. I mean, the Intel community yeah. doesn't have the right to gather information about U.S. persons, which is, which, is, which is correct, by the way. You don't want the Intel community prying into what American citizens are saying and thinking and doing. So what you needed was some kind of an independent panel of, of, uh, of independent scientists and others who, who are not conflicted uh, to, to really delve into this. They could, and they should talk to the intelligence community about what the intel community knows. But the idea that you would ask the intel community to do this is preposterous. They're not even allowed to look at information gathered by US persons. Well, I'll give you a great example of that. There was The Intercept had an article recently where they reported that the Department of Defense uh, DARPA, which is the advanced research, uh, you know, agency of, of the Pentagon, uh, was given a application for a grant by the Wuhan Institute of Virology and some of its foreign um, <laughs> collaborators to, to create a furin site, uh, 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 you know, um, on, on, on bat coronaviruses to make them more uh, infectious to human beings. Yeah. Holy smokes. I don't even think the IC was aware of that. I, yeah. I strongly suspect that the Intel community wasn't aware that, that the Wuhan Institute of Virology had submitted a grant proposal to create a, a virus very similar to the one that's now making us all sick. Uh, so that's the kind of thing I'm talking about. You can't leave this to uh, a bunch of spies yeah. who, have, who have very narrow authorities, um, rightly have narrow authorities. Um, right. We don't want to go back to, to, the, to the 60s and the 70s where our government spies on us. Um, so anyway, I hope we, we all get another shot at, uh, at some kind of a credible task force or two or three that look into the origins of this, this terrible pandemic. So, well, it's the 20th anniversary of 9-11 and uh, the nation's attention, has, the administration's attention has shifted to, you know, big power politics, uh, geopolitics, whereas Al Qaeda has grown. I mean, it was 400 guys on 9-11 and now it's estimated between 40 and 45,000 members of Al Qaeda and its affiliates reaching from uh, Morocco to uh, Bangladesh. Uh, and I, I worry that we've lost our focus on a yet another really dangerous element uh, facing us in the future. Yeah, I, I mean, I, and I, I defer in many ways to uh, uh, Ali Soufan on, on these big questions. I mean, he's been monitoring um, with, with extreme acuity the, 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 the shape of political Islam and, and uh, what these various jihadi groups are, are doing today. Um, yeah, I, I don't uh, think we're, we're safer uh, than we were given um, the spread of, uh, uh, of, of political Islam. Uh, at the same time though, there, there are a lot of people across the Muslim world who are uh, more skeptical than ever of political Islam. And mm -hmm. uh, you're starting to see some interesting dynamics that over time I think will, will work to the advantage of, of our collective national security against these poisonous ideologies. I mean, you, you've seen uh, with the Abraham Accords, 
you now have Israel uh, working with um, uh, four uh, Arab nations uh, on, uh, you know, uh, they've reestablished ties and they're working together right. for their collective national security. I think that's a positive uh, uh, sort of yeah. development. Uh, a lot of these countries have, have done a lot to beef up their own internal defenses uh, against these poisonous ideologies. So e even, you know, th these, these, these groups pull people to them, but they have a harder time operating in, in many countries where it used to be easier for them to operate. I think that's a positive uh, trend, but yeah. Uh, but, you know, like you said, we're still talking about tens of thousands of people um, mm. who, uh, who, are, who are looking for um, a, a place to anchor uh, a, a caliphate with all of this um, uh, sort of romantic ideas about uh, about um, uh, you know running a, uh, a contiguous zone of geography uh, based purely on um, the most the least modern ideas that you can you could ever you know um, imagine. And um, that, of course, that's, that's why I worry about the situation in Afghanistan, where we don't have eyes and ears anymore there. Right. We do have eyes and ears in some of the other pockets of, of the world in North Africa and in the Middle East where, where these groups are, are active. But, but, but we're close enough that we uh, are able to maintain some touch and feel and, and, and sense of where, uh, what they're up to. That, that's not really the case now in Afghanistan. Yeah. And um, General Milley is saying that Al-Qaeda could regenerate itself within six months, uh, at the soonest. And uh, he, he's even cautious because they so badly misguessed how long it would take for the Afghan government to fail. So uh, there's a sense that six months, maybe sooner. Uh, so has Al-Qaeda found its new home? And if so, what are we gonna do about it? Well, you know, I. I'm I'm deeply skeptical that the Taliban uh, would ever live up to its um, agreement to sever ties with Al Qaeda. I mean, they didn't sever ties with them <laughs> right after 9/11, uh, which right. cost them you know 20 years uh, of of time in Afghanistan. They certainly didn't sever their ties during these 20 years that that we were at war uh, against them. And now the Taliban is really f kind of a strange. Amalgam in any case, you've got the Haqqani group, which is a designated terrorist organization right. that now dominates Kabul, the, the capital. Um, you've got the Southern sort of Kandahar Taliban uh, that, that represent sort of a different faction. You've got, you could almost argue that a third faction are the negotiators, the Taliban negotiators that interacted with, with our government um, uh, to come to the agreement in the first place. Uh, that doesn't bode well for the idea of, of, uh, of the Taliban breaking ties with Al Qaeda. Uh, mm -hmm. What do we do about it? Um, uh, you know, <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't know. I mean, we've, I, I've, I've heard a range of views from the idea that we could do over the horizon strikes. Um, I'm extremely skeptical of that when we don't have an intelligence presence in the country. Uh, you saw the tragic uh, bombing uh, the, the, the final bombing of the, the United States uh, conducted in, in Afghanistan. Uh, it appears that it killed, uh, uh, you know, innocent people uh, who were mistaken for terrorists. Right. Um, uh, uh, you know, Leon Panetta, who was a former CIA director and former Secretary of Defense, has warned we may be back in Afghanistan. I, I don't discount that possibility, um, but um, uh, it, it's, it's going to be messy. It, it could be a repeat of Iraq. And uh, that's, you know, we've already seen this movie. Uh, is there any hope in your opinion that the Taliban will prove to be a more moderate influence in that region? They're, you know, they've got a bankrupt nation. Uh, they're, the population of Afghanistan has changed considerably uh, in the 20 years. Uh, you know, women are educated and so on. Do you, do you have any hope that uh, there could be a change? Or on the other hand, could it be even worse? Could it all spill over into Pakistan, uh, where the Taliban really started, and uh, and undermine that country as well? Yeah, you know, uh, I don't see the indicators yet that the Taliban would be a more moderate moderate version of itself. Um, uh, it's conceivable, but I don't see those indicators at this point. You know, Pakistan. Um, uh, or, more, or more accurately, the, the ISI, you know, uh, that, that backed 
really created the Taliban in the first place, right, back in the 90s, and continued to provide safe haven and support uh, to varying degrees of the course of, of that war. I, I mean, I, I'm always struck by the former ISI commander uh, who was quoted saying, um, uh, you know, a few years back, um, you'll have to check the quote, but, he, but I think he said, uh, look, with, with American support, we, uh, we drove the Soviet Union out of Afghanistan. And now with American support, we're going to drive the Americans out of Afghanistan. Yeah, yeah. You know, uh, it, I, I think that, that Pakistan uh, in being, um, or the ISI in, in, in being uh, so clever, uh, has, has, uh, may not end up with what it bargained for. You know, this idea of strategic depth or the idea of, of, of con allowing the Taliban to continue bleeding uh, a new uh, democratically elected government in Afghanistan backed by, you know, dozens of countries around the world, but uh, allowing it to continue bleeding that effort in the hope that somehow uh, that would serve Pakistan's national security interest. Uh, I'm not so sure. Pakistan uh, has, has, um, pretty much destroyed the trust uh, of an entire generation of American uh, diplomats and national security oh. officials um, uh, who, you know, are, are feel rather bitter about how things worked out over the last 20 years. Um, uh, you know, P Pakistan, uh, you know, I, I've been arguing that in some ways India, which is, is, is not is not a winner in this latest outcome. In some respects now has to deal with two Pakistans, but now Pakistan might have to deal with another Pakistan itself in the form of a, of a, uh, uh, a, a, a very um, unruly uh, country on its, uh, right there on its border in Afghanistan. Well, to wind up, let's talk a little bit about uh, cyber war. Uh, we are, you know, you may not call it a war, but the, the assaults on America commerce on hospitals all over the world you know you know just everything you can think of uh has been unbelievable the privacy you know is is a thing of the past uh this is i think poses a real danger to free societies and we seem incapable of finding the right kind of response look i i i think there hasn't been nearly enough um deep thinking uh, about the ways that social media um, are, are undermining, you know, as I said at the, at the top, um, liberal democracy, right? That, that's a problem purely domestically, just in a vacuum, uh, but it's also a problem because uh, foreign adversaries that don't mean us well, including Russia and China, uh, are using these same platforms, our platforms, which are banned in their, in, well, at least in the case of China, they're banned, uh, in their borders, but they're using those to try to foment uh, even deeper divisions uh, inside of our borders and, 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 to, and to harm American self-confidence, you know, confidence in our, in our system of government. And so, um, so, so how do you deal with that? Right now, the debate is about how do you get your arms around disinformation? And, and, and I'm not sure that's the place where you want, where you want to start because there are so many truths in our lives that are subjective, right? I mean, do, do you really want a, uh, a Silicon Valley, you know, nerd to decide uh, w what's true or not? Uh, no, <laughs> you know, there are too many, too many things that are subjective in any case. That's not how our, our society was, was framed, that, that we would have some arbiter of truth. On the other hand, if you came at it from the standpoint of civility, I think that you may actually start to solve some of the problems of disinformation by a, a, trying to um, in, implement, and it, it would have to be voluntary at first, but there are ways to also incentivize uh, uh, that. The idea that, that incentivizing more civil discourse on social media um, tamps down the anger, the, out, the constant machine of outrage, tamps down some of the overweening pride and, and, and yeah. performance that people are always displaying on their, on their personal you know, uh, social media accounts. If you start focusing on civility as the thing that could get you, you know, bumped off or, or, or to demote uh, you know, how, how much uh, traction and, uh, and sharing uh, and, and retweeting and so forth of things, if, if things are uncivil and you start to demote the uncivil 
discourse, you may find that you've got something that's a, a little bit more in tune with what the framers imagined, which was informed debate, vigorous debate, significant disagreement, yes, but not ad hominem attacks or um, you know the constant uh, ascribing of, of evil motive to people who don't agree with you. So I think that that might be the way to, to start trying to find an answer here. We have to find an answer, Larry, because uh, it, I, it struck me the other day that if you're a rep, an elected representative in government, in Congress, or a governor or a president of the United States, you can't govern when there is a, a, a lynch mob outside your door 24 seven with torches and pitchforks. That's the, that's the environment we now live in. And right. people, you know, people criticize the right for being too beholden to President Trump. And, and certainly it's true that people on the, you know, members of Congress, and the Republican Party are constantly scared of what what one man might say about them. But on the left, I would say you have the same problem, except they're scared of what anybody with a with a Twitter account with 10 followers might say about them. So everyone's no no representatives yeah. have have enough breathing room to actually start um having conversations with one another, with people across the aisle. Uh, uh, they're they're on the, under this constant scrutiny by a 24 uh, seven angry mob, which, which yeah. and that you can't govern that way. No system can govern that way. It's, it, we're, it's trending towards a, a, a pure democracy that is actually closer to anarchy than it is to what the framers had imagined. So I think that coming at it, trying to find ways to come at this through imp, enforcing greater civility Will, 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 will might be our pathway um, out of this this mess, but we better find a pathway because I don't think we're going to survive uh, the right. status quo. Well, Matt, thank you. It's been a joy and a pleasure talking to you as always. And uh, I want to thank uh, Sufan Institute, uh, the group, uh, for inviting us to be a part of this uh, conference. And uh, I hope that you all enjoyed it, and we look forward to doing this again next year. Thanks, Larry. It's great to it's great to be with you. My pleasure.